So if you haven't seen that movie, that's called Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris. It's not going to win a lot of awards, but it's a great, cute, you know exactly where it's going movie. Now, I don't know if you have ever been treated like you don't belong. That is a wonderful feeling. No, we've all been treated that way, but we've also been treated like royalty by people. We've had people who we didn't think we would matter to, who went out of their way to show us that we matter, to show us that they care about us. Today we're going to talk about this idea of living as a servant. And the problem when I talk about this in churches is people tend to think of these grand things that happen. So I'm going to tell you a grand thing that I heard about a few weeks ago. I did uh, a funeral for Mickey's mom, and uh, I've got to be more careful with the story today because Mickey's dad is here as I tell the story, so I'm not allowed to lie like I did last night. No, I didn't. So, so this is a true story. I'm going to try to get all the facts right. I'm going to do my best, 80% at least. So many years ago, uh, uh, Mickey, who many of you know, but his dad lived uh, in Panama. He was based there with the military and uh, knew some missionaries. And what had happened is, and the best, uh, and he wasn't even sure about some of these things, but um, basically a, um, a native from one of the tribes that lived down one of the rivers in Colombia actually was in the city And uh, we can only assume that his wife passed away and they had a brand new baby. And so the dad said, I'm just going to kill the baby. And so the missionary said, how about if we take the baby back to its tribe? And so the missionary went to, uh, 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 to, to Mr. Ramos and his wife and they said, sure, we'll go with you. And so they got in a hollowed out canoe with them and a baby, and went, I said, I said, how many days? He said, oh, oh, just one. I said, just one, how far? 50 miles. Now, I don't know if you have ever floated down the Itchnatukni or one of these springs. It's like a mile, and it seems like forever. 50 miles. So 50 miles, they paddle up river. They take the baby to the native tribe. Then, on the way back, the missionary says, oh, and by the way, we got to stop by a few tribes to pull teeth. So as they stopped by, they got out and they did church services and pulled people's teeth and then came back. And typically, how many of you would say that was an awesome feat? Here, why don't you clap for Mr. Ramos since he's here this morning. 85%? 85%? At least? You tell me later. Okay, so, so here's the truth. When we hear a story like that, we think, that's what we're talking about. When the pastor says, we need to serve, we need to look for these grand opportunities to bring a baby down the river in a foreign country and take it to a tribe. And let me just tell you, that may be what God calls you to do, but likely not. The truth is that serving God means every day looking for opportunities, you ready for this, just to be faithful to what he's called you to do. And what we don't understand is that some of us today are miserable because we're only serving ourselves. We're just doing what we want to do and maybe praying to God once in a while going, God, thanks that I get to do what I want to do. But we never really look around and say, God, is there anybody you want me to serve? Is there anyone you want me to take care of? Is there anything that you need me to do? And we find joy in that. But let me tell you something else. We also sometimes in that will find misery. It doesn't sound like a good TV preacher, does it? (laughs) Serving God means doing whatever it takes. It means that sometimes you're going to be afraid because sometimes when you step up to help somebody or go out of your way to help somebody, there's a fear involved in, do I really want to step out and do what I'm called to do? It also means that if you're really following God, sometimes you're going to feel unappreciated. 
I really believe the real work that God does in your life is oftentimes when you feel that you're unappreciated. That's when you really start doing it for God. Before then, you might have not been doing it for God. Maybe you were doing it for yourself and pretending it was for God. But when people let no good deed go unpunished, you start to find out, well, maybe, just maybe, God, do you want me to do this or not? And when you persevere in those times, that's when you really begin to see God bless your life. Because doing what God wants you to do and serving other people is frustrating sometimes. And you may be not only unappreciated, you may be attacked for doing what's right. And the natural desire in us is just say, well, I'm not helping anybody if that's the way they're going to act. But the truth is, you're not supposed to be doing it for them anyway. You're supposed to be doing it for God. So today we're going to talk about three things as you serve. We're going to talk about sympathizing, serving, and surrendering. So let's look at those today. Number one sympathize in the interest of others. Now, most of you know that I have a special needs daughter. Maybe you don't. But I'm going to teach you something that I have learned from the special needs community. And somebody with a special needs daughter basically last night said, exactly. And that is this. Special needs kids. Special needs Adults do not want to be pitied. They want to be sympathized with. They want to be understood. If you've got a child who, who can't sit still, you can't imagine that I was ever like that. Right? We don't want to pity them. What do we want to do? We want to sympathize. How can we help them? What can we do? How can we make their life easier? What can we do to help them in the next step of the way? Let's see what it says here in Philippians chapter 2 as we travel through this book of Philippians. By the way, Steve did a phenomenal job last week, and he's not here this week because in his tough life, he's on a cruise again. Like, I can say anything because I was in Seattle, and it was 50 degrees at this time last week, so... Anybody want to boo me too? Let's just boo everybody. All right. Here we go. Therefore, if you have any... You really did boo. I heard you. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing... And that's where we get the word koinonia. It basically means fellowship with other people in the spirit. If any... Here it is. Tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete. Why or how? By being like-minded, having the same love. And this is where we get the word for sympathy. It means united in sympathy. You're, you're paying attention to how others are feeling. And then it says, being one in spirit and one mind, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, listen, listen, value others above yourself. Now, does that mean to devalue yourself? No. But you need to value them. We tend to look at people and rank them. We like to pretend we don't do that. But if you want to feel better by, about yourself, everybody always tells me, just go to Walmart. Right? Why? Because then I can look down on everybody, right? Right? Because you forgot your shoes. Right? You wore your pajamas. That's why we have a website called People of Walmart. Because we look at it and we go, what an idiot. I would never do that. Oh, yeah. You forget, I know you. Rather in humility, value others above yourself. And then listen to this. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Now, in our world, if we're honest, even if we're Christians and we love Jesus and we want to serve other people and we want God to use us, the truth is there is selfish gravity. So it does not take long before you feel that pull of selfishness and self-centeredness, even if you begin doing what's right. When somebody doesn't appreciate you, when you don't get just what you want, if things don't feel just right, if, you, if, if, if somebody doesn't say thank you enough, if you get a mean letter. I've always thought about going to heaven and when I'm in heaven, I meet one of the martyrs 
And I don't know that it's a martyr, somebody who died for their faith. And they say, what was your struggle on earth? And I say, oh, I got the meanest note one day. How about you? Oh, I was, my family was fed to lions. Oh. And yet on earth, isn't it true that that mean note? Oh, maybe I won't do anymore. I used to help, and then somebody wrote me a mean note. We need to have the martyr test once in a while. Whatever your struggle is, imagine saying to a martyr in heaven, my biggest struggle was, and fill in the blank and see how it goes. They never said thank you. I was burned at the stake. Thank you. Because the truth is, if we're honest about it, we sometimes make any excuse. And let me, let me tell you something. The enemy wants you to do that. He wants you to withdraw. He doesn't want you to use your gifts. He doesn't want you to bless anybody. And he will use any petty, little, nitpicky thing. I had years ago, somebody quit serving at church because they were holding the door. And somebody said, could you close the door? And they threw down the bulletins and came to me and said, we will never help here anymore. And I went, thank God. Because you were doing it for the wrong reason anyway. If you're that easily offended, you're serving the wrong God. And it's in the mirror. Now, it's easy for me to say that <clears throat> until Monday. When I go, you know, can't believe this happened. So-and-so said this to me. And I have those same conversations as you. I'd love to tell you that I'm more spiritual than you. I wish I could. It's a lie. Anybody who's ridden with me in the car knows that. <laughs> Romans 12.10 says this, listen. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. I have some missionaries and, and, uh, that I knew in the Philippines. And you guys can tell me if you think this is true. They said to me, they had groups from all over the world come and help them. They said, you know who the worst groups were? Americans. You know why? Because they would come and look down on everybody. They thought because they had air conditioning and clean water that they were better than the people that they were visiting, not realizing that the people that they were visiting had better family lives, better home lives. Does that sound about right, my missionary friends? Okay. But Jessica, you should know that too, right? Yes, she's not. Good. I'm getting lots of yeses. That's good. Sometimes if we're not careful, even when we serve, we pretend we're doing it for others, but we really are doing it for ourselves. And so we always have to evaluate, God, I really want to do something for you. Hey, when's the last time you did something anonymous for somebody? When's the last time you did something that nobody could find out about? Look for those opportunities to say, God, I want to sympathize. I want to look for the needs around me and look to be a help, an encouragement, a blessing, even in what seems like a small thing. Maybe it's not traveling 50 miles upriver. Maybe it's mowing the neighbor's grass. Maybe it's bringing somebody soup. Maybe it's writing a nice note to somebody. Maybe it's washing dishes, mopping a floor doesn't have to be something big. Number two, serve like Jesus. You ever forget what you're doing while you're doing it? I just thought it was old age, and then I realized, nope, just me. So we got to rent a boat when we were on vacation. It was awesome. We went to a place called Sheeland, which I called Chiland the whole time I was there until somebody corrected me, and then I tried to think of the hundred different people that I pronounced their town wrong. Be like saying cacao. Big idiot running around town. So we rented a boat. We rented a tube. I love. I would love to tell you that I love pulling people in the tube. No, no, no. I love dumping them out of the tube. That's my favorite part. <laughs> and this boat was fast. And boy, at any moment, I could just go whoop. And just wah. Ah. No alligators in that lake. No snakes. I didn't even know what to do. They did have random floating logs. That was fun. 
you're not supposed to take the tube towards it. It doesn't work like a speed bump. Anyway, so so Jenna Jenna's in the boat with me, and and Kristen and Elise are in the tube. And I said, uh, Jenna, you you keep an eye on the tube. Just let me know so I can drive and let me know if they fall out. So we're going full speed. All of a sudden, I hear ah. I turn around, the girls are both out of the tube. I look over at Jenna, she's looking at her phone. I said, well, you're supposed to be watching them. She goes, oh, am I? Yeah, they're out of the tube. When Jesus tells us to serve, can I tell you a secret? We're like, uh, am I supposed to do that? Do you mean me? I thought you meant somebody else. I thought you meant those missionary people. I thought you meant that pastor. I thought you meant... No, no, no. He calls us all to serve. Listen to what it says next. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, which literally means he emptied himself. By the way, in order for you to help people, sometimes you have to empty yourself of your pride. You have to empty yourself of your selfishness, your wants, your preferences. By the way, if you really want to love people, you have to give in with your preferences. You can't get your radio station all the time. If you got in a fight over that on the way here, you can confess that on the way home. All right. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, under heaven, excuse me, under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, people wear crosses all the time to remind us of the death of Christ. And we wear crosses without. People say every once in a while, I'll say, why do we not have a Jesus on the cross? Because we recognize that Jesus rose again, so we have a cross without Jesus on it. But the truth is, another symbol that we could easily use is the towel. Because Jesus made himself a servant. Do you know why Jesus washed his disciples' feet? This is so deep and theological. You better hold on. Buckle up. You ready? Their feet were dirty. There it is. Do you know who you should help? Somebody that has a need that you know. Don't wait for lightning to hit your house to serve somebody. Don't wait for God to speak to you. Build an ark. Bill, build an ark. Don't wait for that. You ready? You know why Jesus knew to wash his disciples' feet? Because he noticed they were dirty. Doesn't that sound spiritual? And yet, it's one of the most touching things symbols of Jesus being a servant. When's the last time you went out of your way to give up your preferences, your rights, your comfort, your time to serve someone else, to bless someone else, to lay down all of the things that you like and say, what do they need? I'm going to serve them. That's what it means to serve like Jesus. The Bible says he emptied himself. We have to empty ourselves of all those preferences. In 1 Peter it says this, Each of you should use whatever gift you received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. I want to just read some of the teams in our church. If you didn't know all these different people that serve, and they all do different things. We have the A team. We have a street cleanup team. We have a men's breakfast Bible study. He's not here today. Give him a harassment for me. Uh, We do the Blumobile, praise team, greetings, ushers, shoeboxes, faith stories, announcements. Believe it or not, announcements is a ministry. If they're done poorly, it's the opposite of a ministry, right? 
Kitchen and Hospitality Team, which, by the way, Gary would love some extra help. Children's Ministry, Jill would love some extra help. Youth, Senior Lunch, Ladies' Lunch, Ladies' Bible Study, Closed Small Group, Surf Awakening. Shout out back there, Surf Awakening. Give me some kind of surf noise. You guys got a surf noise? Keith, you got a surf noise? Radical dude, what do you, you got anything? Keith and Beth are back there, okay. Sound, lighting, video, Randy always needs help. Sunday night Bible study, Thursday night Bible study, cards to seniors, birthday cards, mission trips in country. By the way, we've got another one coming up. I'll be telling you about that in the next few weeks. Won't I, Peggy? Where's Peggy? Oh, on a cruise? Do we, we have frequent flyer miles here that I'm not aware of. We do supplies for the Sharing Center, Fall Festival, Hang Into the Greens, Christmas Eve, Snow, and even an information table. And that's just some of the ministries that happen right here, not including all the ones that you guys do in the community. We have folks in our church that invite youth over every week, teach kids how to play instruments, all kind of things. It's just a touch. So here's my question to you. Where are you serving? When did you last go out of your way to be a blessing to somebody else? Just do it. It doesn't have to be something big. It doesn't have to require 50 miles of paddling with a baby. Thank God for that. I love this. Billy Graham says this. The highest form of worship is the worship of unselfish Christmas Christian service. The greatest form of praise is the sound of consecrated feet seeking out the lost and the helpless. And then finally today, number three, surrender to God's work in you. Let me tell you something, when you first start to serve, you're going to be excited and terrified. I cannot tell you the number of church pastors who were going to plant churches and struck out on their own or went to start something who called me and said, Eric, this is exciting. And then I say, and terrifying. And they go, yes, how did you know? Because anytime you obey God, it's exciting and terrifying. If you've never been baptized and you want to get baptized, I can tell you right now, it's exciting and terrifying. When you want to help in an area in the church, it's exciting and terrifying. Always, always. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Time out. So Paul's writing this from jail, and we in English mistranslate it because we think of work out like work on. And that's not what this says. When this says work out, what it literally means is perform or do. Basically, do what God has put in you. What does it mean to carry out? It means that God has blessed you with every spiritual blessing. So if you're working out, it means you're doing what God has called you to do. It doesn't mean you're trying to earn your way to heaven. It doesn't mean you're trying to earn your way to God. It means that because you're saved, because God has saved you, the grace that he's poured on you, guess what? You're now pouring that on other people. You're taking what God has poured into your life, and you're taking your little bit, and you're pouring it into someone else's life. By the way, teachers, you do this every day. I don't know how you teach anymore. But thank you for pouring into the lives of others this week. I know the year's just starting, and you probably, you might, your cup may feel empty. <laughs> then you say, God, would you refill me? Would you fill me up so I can pour out? And then it says, for it is God who works in you and will and act in according to his, fulfill his good purpose. And then I don't like this verse, so we're going to take it out of the Bible, okay? Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you'll shine among them like stars in the skies you hold firmly to the word of life. Now listen to this. This is a guy writing from jail. And then I'll be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and I rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Paul from jail is looking at the early church and saying, I'm so proud of you. As I see you using the gifts that God's given you and work out what God is doing in you, I am so proud of you. 
Now, I don't know about you, but my letter from jail would not sound like that. Send snacks. <laughs> Eric. Right? But instead, what's Paul saying? I-, I am so proud of what God's doing in your life. You just keep serving the way God's put it in you. You keep doing what God's called you to do. I am so proud of you. And I- I'm looking forward to the day that I can say, God, look at what they're doing. Ephesians 2, 8, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Living like a servant isn't one big thing. It's daily things. It's doing whatever it takes to be a blessing every day. It's being afraid and feeling unappreciated and frustrated and yet working through it by sympathizing, serving, and surrendering. We turned it off on purpose. We're going to pretend. I'll never forget years ago taking 7th and 8th graders to Kentucky to the hollers out in the middle of nowhere. We actually were told to be careful where we went on these dirt roads because we could get shot by moonshine runners. Thanks, Pastor. But I'll never forget one year we went up there and these kids, 7th and 8th graders, are helping with 5th, 6th, and 7th graders in some cases. There were kids their age that came with their younger brothers and sisters. They got to see kids come with holes in their shoes and holes in their clothes that didn't have anything. Take them back to houses that were basically shacks. And I'll never forget at the end of one of these mission trips, all the kids on the mission trips, all the kids on this mission took their suitcases and gave them to the kids and said, I got enough. And I remember going home on a very empty bus with nothing underneath it and thinking, these parents are going to kill me. (laughs) But let me tell you what happened instead. I got call after call after call. Thank you so much for letting my child see what having need is like what meeting needs is like. They are a different kid because they came and served someone else. Listen, if a 13 and 14 year old can figure out a little more about life by serving people, I don't care if you are 30 or 98. We all have a lot to learn when we serve other people. Just do what God's called you to do. Give away what he's put in you. And as you do that, God will change you. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'll be here after the service. Love to talk to you about what it means that Jesus came and died for you. He died for me, which makes no sense. If you know me really well, you know I don't deserve that. He did because he loves me. And if he loves me, can I guarantee he loves you? He even loves Paul. And the truth is, because he loves us, he died and rose again so that when we surrender our lives to him, we can have a relationship with God. If you want that relationship with God, I'd love to talk to you and pray with you after this service. You can surrender your life to him. Maybe you're here today, but the truth is, you've been selfish and self-centered. Maybe you want to sacrifice. I want to encourage you this week, send a text to the church, an email to the church, maybe one of those teams you want to be a part of, or maybe, just maybe, you already know what God's calling you to do. You just haven't wanted to do it. So make a commitment today. God, I'm going to take that next step and do what you've called me to do. Would you join me as we close in prayer today? Father, thank you for this time together. We thank you for your word. Thank you that you came as a servant. Lord, you could have come just as a king and reigned over us and told us what we were doing wrong and told us how messed up we are, but instead you served us. You showed us what it meant to wash feet. You showed us what it meant to care about others. So Lord, help us to do that. Father, Make it very clear to us what you're calling us to do. And Father, make us sensitive to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen.